So um, we wanted just to make, make sure that you know we do have a plan for this evening and this is it. Um, obviously the welcome Thank you to Constance for welcoming us all here tonight. Um, we're going to start with a sort of level setting uh, uh, moment. And some of you may feel this is a little bit basic, but we did want to make sure that everybody started with a basic understanding of sustainability, the definitions, themes, and principles that will carry us through as we explore this topic more in depth through the next sessions. Um, we're going to be focusing tonight on making the case for sustainability for business, making the case for business. Um, Often in our lives we have to say why we're focusing on something, why sustainability is important to what we're doing, and we'll be practicing a lot of that messaging as we go through, first going through the arguments for it and then figuring out how to communicate it in an effective way. It is what? A live coral. It absolutely is a live coral. All right. Problem. This coral has been bleached. Now what bleaches coral? Temperature. Temperature is absolutely a factor. What else? Getting down. Hmm? Pollution, so we have dead zones. What else? The pH level. Acidity, that's right. So the acidity of the ocean is changing. It's just one of the things that our natural system is changing. But what will that impact? Food supplies, fishing, livelihoods. People around the world rely on fishing for this, their uh, daily existence. This is about the bark beetle. I think it's called the bark beetle. The bark beetle is a beetle that kills trees. So what industry is that impacting? Forestry. Absolutely, forestry. And what else? What happens? Else. Housing, all construction, and fires. You have more dead trees, fires. And what do trees do for us as part of their natural system? They take in? Pollution. The, um, yes, they do. They take in pollution. The kind of pollution they take in is carbon. Right, so we're impacting the trees that help us with the natural system of the earth. So there's no doubt the natural system is changing. And there's a lot of ways you can impact the natural system. What is that? It's something that's coated in oil. It's absolutely uh, a, some kind of bird that's covered in oil. Pollution affects the natural system just like what a temperature does. <laughs> Can you see that? This is a new picture. Do you guys know what this is? It's Beijing. I don't know if you've been watching the news, but this is an amazing <coughs> picture. And check that out. Now, I was in Beijing uh, three years ago. And at that time, we could not see across the square. They can't see across the street. The natural systems are changing, everybody. There's no question. There's many examples here. But I'd like to share with you that businesses know. Businesses know and businesses are aware. And they are taking action to be resilient to the changes that are coming. They don't always know what kinds of changes are coming. But I guarantee you, businesses know what's happening, what's coming, and they're ready. And they've been ready for quite a while, many of them. So let's talk about money. Because you can't talk about businesses with talking about money. So I wish I had a pointer. Anything here a pointer? Ah! <laughs> it's a miracle. So what these are are billion dollar weather and climate disasters. And so there's two things for you to look at here. On the left side here is the number of events. So that's zero billion dollar events, two billion dollar events. There's four of them, six, eight, et cetera. And the bars represent the number of events that we had over time. 1980, for instance, they had um, about $1 billion event. In 2010-ish, it looks like they had $14 billion events. Now, the little lines going like this on this chart, those are the dollars. What do you think that was right about there? Katrina. Katrina, absolutely. Can you guys guess what Sandy is? It's uh, way high. Now, in 2012, I looked at the preliminary numbers. In 2012, they actually didn't have quite as many. There are 11 events that were more than a billion dollars. However, two of those events were huge. One of them was the drought, and the other was Sandy. And the number is going to be right around there, depending upon how you count it, because there's a difference between damage and insurance coverage. So I don't know about you, but it doesn't take much imagination 
If you are an insurance company and they keep track of dollars and they know how much things are costing, you can see an upward trend. You can tip this up or down. It just doesn't take much um, imagination to see that what's happening here is an increase in the number of events. Yes, some are higher, some are lower. And it doesn't take much imagination to see that the dollars cumulative are going up and the insurance companies know. Their actuarials have been thinking about this for years. So this is a great example of um, time over time, businesses are aware, don't think they're not, and they're ready for it and they're embracing it and they're ready for resilience. What does sustainability mean? You're able to be resilient. If you're sustainable, you're gonna survive, right? Companies need to survive. They're making the changes necessary. <coughs> Lord, excuse me, what does CPI stand for in that graph? Um, uh, consumer, consumer index. index yeah. yeah, and so what they did was they normalized it. Yeah. Actually, most people don't ask me, so I don't bother to explain it. Good question. So they also normalized the dollars to our new numbers. So the old numbers, they had to normalize them so that they could tell the difference. Let's talk about who um, Munich Re is, or it could be Swiss Re. These are reinsurance companies. This is one of the two largest insurance companies in the world, and as of 2010, this is their public statement. The only plausible explanation for the rise in weather-related catastrophes is climate change. So if you were to ignore the dialogue that happens around climate change and just step back and think about what does business know, I'm showing you that business not only knows, but known a long time. And the experts that keep track of dollars have known for a long time, and that's why Thinking about sustainability and how it relates to business makes sense. When do we get to the point that insurance companies can't afford to insure you or you can't afford to buy the insurance? I, um, I would submit that we're already at that point in some states. So as an example, in the state of Florida, uh, I'll start with cars. In the state of Florida, there was a point where it made no sense anymore for them to insure cars or Massachusetts. The insurance company went, no, actually, the numbers don't work. The insurance companies now, if you think about it, are already have to have money reserved for climate. So now they're calculating the risk. And what does business think about all the time? Risk and how to mitigate risk. The insurance companies are thinking about risk. They're doing their weighing. They're watching the climate trend. And now they're trying to make sure they have enough money in reserves. If your question is, when do we have uh, the inability to buy insurance, I would submit that there will be places in the United States and the world that it's now. I would also submit that the insurance companies are very carefully weighing how and what they will insure because climate risk is a new anomaly and there is uh, litigation against insurance companies if they don't insure it properly. So as a huge financial industry, they absolutely must think about how they mitigate their risk because their risk is our risk. I think it's $23 trillion are what the insurance companies um, are involved with in investments. They're watching. Did I answer your question? Yes, sort of. Um, because if you say that business is prepared and understands the risk, I submit that small business might understand the risk, but I question whether it's prepared because it can't be. <coughs> Um, so I'm going to agree with you first off. So the, the bigger statement that I made there was actually targeted more at larger organizations. So absolutely. But there aren't easy answers to a lot of these questions now. There aren't any answers actually. Because we don't even know what some of the new things we're going to, uh, that are going to come into our lives are going to be. So if you're resilient, you are able to adjust to the flow of what's coming and that's what will keep you sustainable as an organization or as a person going forward. Do we look at ourselves as the business and organization because if we're staying What we see repeatedly now is small businesses banding together yeah. so that they have a different way of approaching things as an entity, kind of as a group. Okay? okay. So we were going to take a break, break. but... Do you want to come out and go forward? Or? How is... Tell us. We have a lot of content tonight and our exercises are at the end. So should we just kind of keep marching forward? Okay. Okay, so we're going to segue into the second part, which is talking about making the business case for sustainability. And a lot of smart businesses and events and organizations are already making that case. 
Um, in particular, this is a, a quote from the head of sustainability for the London Olympics. We're just over. And he says, an effective sustainability approach creates efficiencies, saves costs, and helps generate additional revenue. So those are pretty much basic bottom line goals. The key to this, this um, relative success, I mean, it wasn't 100% zero waste, the, the, but they, they made a lot of strides towards making the Olympics sustainable in the middle of a very large city, which had a lot of challenges in terms of uh, carbon footprint and, and suppliers and stuff. And what, the, what was a requirement by the London Olympics is that the head of sustainability be involved in every single procurement decision. He wasn't sitting away in his little sustainability office and somebody would occasionally knock and wave at him. He was at the table whenever any of those business decisions was being made, representing that that need of the company, of the, of the event, if you will, so. Great. So you've probably heard a lot of arguments against sustainability. Oh my gosh, what are some of the things that you hear? Why would I want to go green? It costs too much. What are some other arguments? Come on, you must have heard them. It takes too much time. It's too hard. It's hard. It's hard. Yes, what else? It impacts my business. Yes, it impacts my business in a, neg in a negative way, people say. Yes, what else do they say? There's an attitude in the industrial part called the third. If you stick your head up to become green or do something nice, you're just basically attracting uh, the governmental uh huh. Right, right. And, uh, Government regulation, strangling me, cut, cut, yeah, cutting me off at the knees, right? Absolutely, yeah. So here are some examples. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There are people who just well, it doesn't. It's, it's not going to. It's not going to make any difference. I would have to change. Oh, change is hard. Change is hard. Change is hard. And change is the only thing. The only thing in everything that we've said today is the only thing you can be certain of is that things are changing. Change is the only certainty. So you can fight it as much as you want. Sorry, dudes. It is here. It is happening, no matter what. Um, things are just fine the way they are. There are still, there are people who think that. You know, it, 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 you know things, it's, gonna, it's all going to work out. It's going to be fine. Maybe they will. And it won't make a difference. My little company or my little bringing my plastic bags or whatever it is, my little, my reusable bags, hopefully, won't make a difference. It won't make a difference. And the very famous regulation is strangling us. Regulation, uh, the government keeps telling me what to do. It's not letting my business grow. This is a, this is a terrible thing. So what we're going to do now is take you through um, responses, shall I say, responses to some of these, um, these, que these questions. And we have here a list of the business benefits of sustainability that we hope to illustrate as we go through the evening. Sorry. Sorry, there's supposed to be seven. Pretend like it said six. Did it say six? <laughs> now it's not going backwards. Oh, bummer, dude. There we go. Oh, now it's going to build again. OK. Well, there were seven. There were seven. Anyway, so brand value and reputation. And um, we have some examples of how uh, going sustainable can burnish your brand um, with your shareholders, stockholders, with investors, with your customers and consumers. It can be a, a lot of people are demanding this now. Employee and future workforce attraction. A lot of people are values driven in where they decide to work. And if you have a reputation as a company that takes sustainability into account, you will, and they have done studies about this. This, my mother um, uh, had, you know, passed away recently, but was a, you know, sort of depression baby. And, and till the day she died, she had dementia. She couldn't remember her name, but to the day she died, when she could still brush her teeth, she would always put the, put the wet, wet the toothbrush, turn off the water, and brush her teeth, and then turn it back on when she needed it. It was that idea that this was a limited resource that you took care of. And it's true. So it's not, it's not merely generations that don't remember. That there, there, are, there are times, and it's because she grew up in a time when there was scarcity, right? So for better or for worse, we'll probably get back to, to some kind of, of value shift around that. Um, so yeah. yeah. Um, so operational effectiveness. Sustainability practices can make your business more effective. And we have a couple, a couple of case studies around that for small businesses and large, making you more efficient. Risk management. Because we know that what is the only certainty? 
Yes, thank you. Change is the only certainty. And so managing the risks that come from change, will, uh, if you're a sustainable business, will just make you more resilient. Okay, and we'll be giving some examples of that too. Um, organizational growth. You can, uh, as, and I'm sure there are probably people that we can think of this in, in, in this room or even in certain auto companies, for instance. You can have what they call brand extensions. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add a new line of green products to my already, what I already have, okay? So there's a lot of organizational growth, a lot of opportunity to take advantage of. And then, and business opportunities in terms of partnering uh, and, and finding different forms of funding, et cetera, okay? So those are some of the business benefits, and we'll try to give some illustrations of these. But as we saw in the slide that I switched to earlier, some very, very, very large businesses get it. This is the US military. They have uh, tr devoted tremendous, tremendous resources to making their operations more green and efficient, to studying the risks that are arising globally from climate change and preparing as a, as a military uh, force for it, and as you see, deep investment in renewable energy because they, not because they love the earth, maybe they do, but because it's the right thing to do for what they need to do to survive. Okay, so this is not, this is not a touchy-feely beautiful thing, but this is a touchy-feely place and they have also uh, embraced renewable energy among other the green things. Shines. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yay, Pope. <laughs> Uh, Laura Lee, do you want to speak to this one? Coming. So, uh, does anybody recognize what those are? Phone books. They're phone books, right? Phone They're phone books. Yellow, yellow pages. Yes? Ha! Ah. Okay. And what, what, how has that business model, has, how has that business model been affected? It's huge, right? And, and part of the issue here is that the value that the phone company provided was not really that paper. It was the information that was on the paper. And when you, when you frame your business in a particular way, well, I, I publish yellow page books. It's a different way from framing it yourself. Well, I provide people with the information they need to contact other people. Okay, so reframing your business in a more sustainable fashion to adapt to the changes. Oh, there, when there wasn't an internet, it made perfect sense that we all had our phone books, right? Um, and this has been a huge impact on sustainability, Yellow Pages in particular. Um, San Francisco did a study that 40% of their solid waste was Yellow Pages being discarded every year. And so they are now trying to pass, I, I actually went down to City Hall and t helped testify about it. I'm not sure, I don't think, I still don't think it's passed, but they were trying to make it so that it was, um, you had to request a Yellow Pages, that it wouldn't be automatically delivered to your door because millions and millions of these things were just being, and it's a cost to the city. The city has to, be, you know, they have to be picked up, they have to be recycled, all that stuff. That's, this is a cost to the city. You want us to act efficiently? Okay, well, this is what we need to do. So, it's, again, it's, it's rephrasing your business in, in a such a way that makes, accepts the changes that are coming and still allows you to thrive. There are still needs for this information. It just needs to maybe be delivered in a different way. Oh. Sorry. So, and this is, this is one of the arguments that we hear, uh, I can, regulations are strangling me, and, and, and it, it can seem sometimes as a business owner like there are so many rules to follow and so many agencies telling me what to do, I'm so confused, and I just, I just can't take it anymore. However, we found, they found in many, many, many cases that actually regulation has the, the the impact of leveling the playing field because it gets it puts everybody at the same place when they passed um, legislation in Germany and Europe to limit what kinds of chemicals people were uh, businesses were allowed to use in certain industrial processes the actual number of patent applications around those around substitution chemicals for that went up it spurred innovation around finding a different way to do to make the same kinds of products and services that, they, that were the same types of products that were being made before so it can level the playing field with your competitors and lead to innovation and when they asked um, California business owners small business owners in California cite access to credit as the main hurdle 
to progress and not necessarily regulations or tax burden. There is a lot of discussion around, oh, California is bleeding businesses because of our regulatory uh, atmosphere. And, time, and you, I don't know if you all saw, the governor of Texas is trying real hard, <laughs> real hard, to entice people to come to his state. Um, but in, in the past, this has happened before, uh, Nevada tried the same thing. And in the, in, in the end, it's actually a very, very tiny number of businesses that actually ever do move out of state because of regulation. It is, this, is a, a, this is an idea that is sort of blown a little bit up out of proportion according to the numbers. Now, this could change because change is the only certainty, right? But for now, that is not really an argument that holds a lot of water, statistically speaking. So, um, Laura Lee, do you want to speak about telling uh, uh, building mandates? And it's not just at the federal level, I should say, because there's Cal Green. There, there are there are regulations in California that. Um, require a certain amount of an industrial and sustain, of sustainable materials. And I actually um, worked with a company um, helping them redesign their marketing. They, they, do, they make acoustical underlayment out of recycled tires. And because they use this, they're, they're taking care of this problem, which is a huge, there are 40 million re uh, tires discarded in Cal just in the state of California every year. It's a huge issue for landfills, exporting, for burning them, all that kind of thing. So they have a process which turns it into acoustical underlayment, which is actually more efficient than the cork and the stuff that was being used before. And because they are a sustainable business, they were given a grant by the state of California to hire the agency I work with. And we did, we, we were in the process of redoing their website and helping them improve their marketing at no cost to them, just because they're doing something that is helping California solve some issues. So there are opportunities out there for businesses that are using, um, that are going sustainable. Okay? And the same. Absolutely. Okay. So there are different ways of embedding sustainability into your organization. We've talked a little bit about extending, and this is one, a local Jr. small business. Operations and product integrity of Carol's Coffee and Tea Company. We're a third generation family coffee roaster here in Oakland, California. My grandfather founded the business back in 1924. And we supply high quality artisan roasted coffees to many of the best East Bay hotels and restaurants. We also sell our products at a retail store and online. Carol's employs 80 people and formulates roasts and packages as custom coffee blends in a 25,000 square foot facility. Back in 2000, the Stockways Business Partnership offered us free help to lower our operating costs through recycling and waste prevention improvements. Stockways, instead of coming in saying, this is our program, take it or leave it, they said, well, what works for you? We're probably going on about 10 plus years of partnership with Stockways, so that attests to the fact that they know how to actually quote unquote partner uh, with companies. Stockways helped us identify and train our staff in terms of how to separate the basic materials. They also got us a grant uh, to buy all the bins to handle all the recycling. On top of that, they identified specific haulers who could pick up those items. Those first initiatives paid big dividends and cost savings. We paid a lot less for garbage service. The next step was to identify the other materials which were a little trickier, and that being mylar, which is our packaging form for our coffee. Um, what they were able to do is they sat down and said, instead of focusing on hauling or picking up or recycling that product, let's identify how we can minimize the production of it. And stock waste went out and helped us get a $100,000 grant towards the purchase of a new packaging machine. And that packaging machine, which is in use now, has been able to cut our mylar waste by 95%. Absolutely amazing. After all the successes we've had with Stop Waste, we decided to focus our attention on um, actually trying to reduce waste throughout a route delivery system that delivers coffee to our customers. What we've decided to do is eliminate cardboard usage through the system by using reusable totes instead of cardboard boxes when we make those deliveries. We've saved in excess of $100,000 each year since we began working with them, and we hope to see that number grow. The Stop Waste team has the expertise you need, and they do it all. So this is, this is the commercial part. Training and coordination with the recycling owners. If you're a business owner in Alameda County, I highly encourage you to reach out to Stockways. You can find them at the website www.stockwayspartnership.org or send them an email at partnership. It involved uh, sort of rethinking how they've always done stuff, okay? And that's where some of that resilience stuff, well, we've always done it this way 
try to, you know, trying to unpack that and say, well, maybe, maybe there's some way we could use 95% less mylar. Uh, and so decreasing waste while also saving $100,000 a year, which is significant for a small business. And not only uh, Ray Anderson. And one of the ways that the company sort of redesigned how they do everything was by redesigning the concept of waste. Redesigning the concept of waste, which they tended to, def which they switched to defining as any cost which does not produce value to our customers. It's a very different expression of what waste is. And uh, Ray was inspired by nature. Can, you, can you anybody give me examples of waste in nature? Besides my dog? <laughs> Even your dog's waste. No. <laughs> no, nature is tremendously efficient. Nature understands that one person's waste is the next creature's food, OK? So, and, the, the, and there, are, there's an, there are entire industry um, organizations devoted to mimicking nature, to using biomimicry to try to understand the processes that has made, that has made nature so efficient throughout life. So, um, Ray asked the company to switch how they define waste and to redefine their processes around that, that definition. Included, and included in that is green chemistry. Yes. Which is another way that you are uh, synthesizing what nature naturally does. Okay. And waste costs money. Waste costs money, the old kind of waste, right? So they calculated that 10% of each sales dollar went to wastes. And between 1994 and 2004, they, by eliminating waste, the savings represented 28% of its operating income. So it w became a way more efficient organization simply by re-looking at all of its operations and redefining waste. And then there's the, <laughs> wondering what, that, what that, that graphic is, aren't you? So that was Ray Anderson redefining a company from the top down. And we had uh, George Vukasin, who was the, the, he actually was not the CEO, he was a VP in the, com in, in, the, in the little coffee company, helping that relationship grow and build. Another way to make change in an organization is by way of an internal green team. And you have some things to say about that, I believe. One region, what's important to them actually is they wanted to have a volunteer day where they planted trees. Because they're about health. They believed. Oops. So they believe that green was important and that they wanted to have trees. So for them, they established and worked with a uh, grassroots level. They raised up through the organization to get days off, a volunteer day, so they could plant trees. That was their idea of what was important for them that happened to have been in Atlanta. In Oakland, the green team went after the pharmaceutical department to see what they could do about having bottles that were made out of uh, recyclable um, plastic or what they could do about getting back your pills so that the pills don't go down the toilet and affect people's health in different ways because they get into your drinking source of water. That was a green team. At Symantec, another organization that I uh, have had the opportunity to work with, they thought about how they would like to suggest to upper management that they package their software so that it always is downloaded instead of sending out those, in the old days, they used to send out um, CDs, right? So a green team meets they get together and think about what they would like to do as a company that would make their company more sustainable. Historically, green teams didn't get much a vision or visibility at the upper levels until now. Now what's happening is there's enough energy behind the green teams that they actually uh, often have a seat at some of the decision tables and they're starting to make recommendations that change products. They are not the people who necessarily design the products but the dream teams, uh, dream and green teams are now starting to bring executives down into the ranks. So uh, it's still grassroots, people still care what's going on, but now they have people in decision layers that are making decisions. At GE, they have a green team per region, and they play games. They have figured out that games makes people work. And so they had a treasure hunt. Their treasure hunt that each green team at each one of their um, uh, corporate offices or regional offices would go out, they trained them for three days, they spent three days of training them on how to go find ways to save money. 
millions of dollars were saved because the local people, they know how things work. They know where the fans are left on. They know where the lights are left on. They know what happens in their facilities. The grassroots people know what makes things work. And so what they figured out at the higher levels of the big companies is that green teams work. And now the green teams are starting to get um, organized in the way they report. So what you can find in this uh, um, guide is A, how to start a green team, B, how to keep it alive so they don't die, because they're taking it out of hide initially. They don't get paid for it. A green team is usually a volunteer organization, but now I'm submitting that quite often organizations that are bigger are starting to um, make it worth their while and give them uh, time to do so. Green teams are now prompting bonuses. The bonuses are predicated on how much money you save the company by sustainable efforts. So organizations are taking advantage of the internal knowledge of a green team to do two things. A, they're going to save money. Absolutely. What else are they going to do? What are the three things you have to do? You take care of money. You take care of society. A lot of them are making sure they do work in their um, areas, volunteer work, so that now they're taking care of the social capital in the area and they're building the rapport with the people that are in the areas where they work, especially around the world. So we took care of social, we took care of the money. What's the third one? Environmental. So environmentally, what are they doing? Quite often what they're doing is they're uh, demanding that their organizations uh, use renewable energy. The shareholders are starting to get impacted and they're making sure and so what you're seeing is grassroots efforts making the leap to the higher levels or in little companies where there's only seven or eight people as a team, they're deciding what they're going to do to make change and they're butting it up with another green team in the same industry. Industries now have green teams. So green teams are very productive in that <laughs> you take all kinds of people. I love this graphic. You take all kinds of people from all levels. Some engineers are good, some janitors are good, some admins are good. The systemic knowledge in a room will make it possible for green teams to be very productive. And if you put any kind of game on it, you will be amazed what people will do to play a game. And so people are playing games now in, um, like at the school where I volunteer, eighth graders, they are, um, Competing by building on uh, which building can save the most energy. You want to see an eighth grader turn off the lights? Put a pizza out there. Works every time. It happens at the corporate level too. We all do it. We all put frequent flyer points. Those are games. So now they're doing, um, uh, some of the organizations are doing frequent flyer points on their frequent carpooling points. And they've got software now where people who are carpooling, they have software that automatically finds who's leaving. So it gets rid of some of the barriers to carpooling. So do you remember on the board we had transportation as one of the areas, thanks to your um, document, thank you very much. Transportation was one area where people will, as a green team, think, how do we make our company work better for transportation? How do we carpool? How do we telecommute? How do we use less paper? You'd be amazed what's internal. So a green team is a very powerful tool, and it can be as little or as big as you want. And that's an example of grassroots. Ray Anderson was top down, right? Thou shalt, he had a, a moment, he realized what he wanted to do and he went down that path. You'll find some companies like Patagonia. You guys ever heard of Patagonia clothing? Now they're a company whose entire DNA of that company, everybody there thinks sustainably. What's really exciting is the people who make the products are the ones that are starting to push product redesign. So when you have uh, some technologies that might make a difference, um, in the industry, it's actually getting pressure from the bottom to make some of these marketing decisions and to make some of these design decisions. I can't say enough good things about green teams. I can also tell you that you will burn them out if they don't get some kind of support, internal support from whoever is the leader of the group, doesn't matter what size, they'll die. And so there's a lot of documentation and history now on how to keep a green team sustainable. sustainable. Yeah, a <laughs> sustainable green team. Anybody here want to start a green team? Yeah. Don't we have a whole session where we're going to talk about free cycle and all of the websites you can go to to do all these sharing now? It's a new model. The new consumer model is very different. And a lot of the companies uh, are trying to engage in that too. Okay.
Let's see. Oh, is it still me? Oh, my favorite topics. Okay, so I have, I have a few vices. So I like. You have a lot of vices. I do. I love red wine. And chocolate's good for my health. I'm positive it's good for my heart. Isn't that right? And and, and sodium. That's it. It's all it's all about sodium. So the the reason this is up here is these are examples of industries, big and small, that have had to be resilient, which means they adjust to changes in the system. The kinds of systems things that they're adjusting to could be social. They could have a change in the people that are working for them or in the areas where they work. They could be adjusting to the uh, nature, bugs, supply chain, all the things that you have to think about as an organization of any type. And so I picked these because they're my favorites. However, there isn't an industry that's out there of any size that's not really adjusting. So we're going to talk about wine. I could talk about chocolate too, but we're going to talk about wine. <laughs> so wine's a multi-billion dollar industry. In fact, in California, you could, as you can see, we have a large percentage of the U.S. 125 billion. I gave this lecture in Argentina. Argentina has wine. In fact, they have a very good Malbec if you like red wine. Oh, they, have they have wonderful wine. And in Argentina, they are very on top of the fact that things are happening to the climate that affect grapes. Grape vines don't like change. They probably don't like change. What else don't they like? <laughs> they don't like change. What else don't they like? What'd you say? Heat. Heat. They don't like heat. And in California, what is happening to our growing region? It's getting hotter. So do you think they're sitting back going, oh, darn? Absolutely not. What they're doing, actually, is they have bought already plots of land where it is. And where would that be? Minnesota. <laughs> not I, we're not. <laughs> we're not talking ice wine here now. So, um, so they actually are moved and already have uh, some a lot of wine uh, vineyards started up in the uh, Washington area. In fact, this become quite a wine growing area. In Argentina, what they've done is they are moving them up the hills to where it's cooler, and they have already lots of instances where they've had to uh, change their industry and change the way people are thinking about wine, because when wine moves, what happens to the taste of your wine? It changes. So now what they have to do is a marketing point of view. They have to change what people think tastes good. And so as an industry, they're thinking about how to market a change in wine, how to market and make sure they are ready in case the temperatures go up or change, et cetera. And as an industry, they're all over it. What other things happen when it gets hot? What kind of bugs come? Pests. Bugs, pests. And so they're also thinking about how they're going to manage naturally handling pesticides and um, um, irrigation. And so irrigation, wine plants like to be starved for water. In fact, they methodically, if you go to the big wineries, they starve every single little plant. They starve it to 75% of the water it would like to have. And that causes the, the vineyards to grow differently and the grapes to taste different. Well, guess what industry is thriving? Remember, there's opportunity where there are challenges. Irrigation. Irrigation. You should see what's happening in the irrigation industry. They got gizmos that fly through the sky, take a look at the vineyards, and tell you what the water content is to the leaf. So it's just an example of an industry that has embraced change. They're making sure that they're ready for change. They are um, mitigating risk. What does sustainability do for you? It helps you mitigate risk. They're mitigating their risk. It helps take care of the fact they don't have a supply chain guaranteed, right? So now they're taking care of a supply chain. They'll make sure they have grapes for their wine. All those six or seven <laughs> things that we had on our list, they're doing all those seven things. So it's just an example. In the chocolate world, Nancy told me I couldn't have this. In the, <laughs> in, the, in the chocolate world, they're changing the yield from their plants because it's hot isn't as much as it used to be. So they're changing the kinds of plants they use to make sure that they have higher yields. So they're actually looking at different yields. And in the potato chip world, in Peru, one of Nancy's favorite places, they have colored potato chips. 
Oh, well, they've got a hundred different varieties of potatoes. But guess where the purple ones grow? Yeah. Peru. Oh. Problem. In Peru, it's hot. Remember all those pictures that I showed you of how hot it is in South America? In Peru, it's hot, and so they have an area of the world there that only makes purple potatoes, and that's one of their supply chain problems. And so they are instead uh, creating a um, kind of like the, my, the very first picture Nancy had. They have their very own agricultural uh, center there where they're experimenting with different kinds of potatoes because they want purple potatoes. So now you've heard about three industries, chocolate, agriculture, wine, agriculture near and dear to our heart, and of course, potato chips. And they are all being resilient. So now you guys can think about other ways that resiliency would work for you. Huh? <laughs> OK, I would like to talk about robots. So I'm a techie. I, like, I just love technology. And um, these are a project from Cal, obviously. And these little water robots, do anybody know about these? Ah, these little water, water robots run around in the water. And this is another example. They use these to, to float up the delta here. So they go right up our delta, and they see what is the salinity, or they're checking what the chemicals are that are in the delta waters. The other way they're using this kind of technology is they're sending them, whoops, I have another one. They're sending them out into the storms. So for Sandy, they sent them out into the water because from the satellites or the planes, you can't look down to see what's happening at the water level. There's no other way. And so they can send these little robot, floating robots out to see what's happening at the ground water level, at the base level for big storms. That way they can start radioing back information. So these are two great examples of an opportunity because change is happening. The natural system's changing. It's impacting our social lives and our ability to have well-being. And some people have jumped on the opportunity as an industry to think about being innovative. Uh, let's read this together. Business is essential to solving the climate crisis because that is what businesses are best at. Innovating, changing, addressing risks, searching for opportunities. There's no more vital task. Do you know who this is? Virgin Airlines. Who can tell? Yes. You, yep, Virgin Airlines. Very famous entrepreneur. If you um, are with Nancy and I, we think that sustainability not only has a place in business, but it's imperative to business. The beauty of the, those metrics is that they're consistent, so that when you're measuring from company to company or continent to continent, you have some way of at least comparing, to some degree, some apples to apples. Now, if you're not a great big company, how do you know if you're a sustainable company? And um, one of the things Nancy for sure will talk about is greenwashing. Greenwashing is alluding to the fact that you're doing um, green things when you're not. Let's, let's save that for a different time. But if you're a small company, do you remember our definition of what makes a, the Reader's Digest version of what makes a sustainable business? You, you think about what? That's one for sure piece. The shorter version. Every time you make a decision, you think about the three legs of the stool. So every business decision you make, if you're going to be a sustainable business, is you've thought about when you procure something, are you buying something because it's the cheapest thing possible, or are you also considering the other two legs of the stool? When you hire somebody, are you thinking about why you're hiring that person, or are you thinking about what will happen to the region where you're hiring them? And so a sustainable business is more than just saving electricity and energy. That's one leg of the stool. A sustainable business is actually thinking about the three legs of the stool. One place where it lives, so depending upon the size of the organization, uh, procurement and purchasing is a very likely place for there to be somebody who thinks about that. Don't forget that grassroots thing. You'd be surprised there may be a grassroots group, grassroots group of people who get together and think about how they are going to do internally things. The other place where it often lives is, is in marketing communications. and communications. And now, some of the bigger companies, I think I share with you, is living at the, even the higher levels. They have chief sustainability officers now. So, and in your industry, there are innumerable resources, I know about healthcare, innumerable resources, e-health, green health, out there that'll help you and your organization think through industry-wide what you can do. 
And sometimes people get a little bit more elaborate. So they talk about there's three kinds of capital. There's human capital. There's actually environmental capital. There's some very valuable capital out there. Water is an unbelievable asset. Air is an unbelievable asset. Bees are an unbelievable asset. And those assets now, they are quantifying in dollars now what our ecosystems are worth. Now people will start figuring out, we hope, how you balance the cost of ecosystem demise with what it would cost to repair it, with what it costs in the money you save to do something else. It's a whole new huge industry on ecosystem services, it's called. In fact, there's a number of graduate degrees on that topic. <laughs> All right. So people, planet, profit, or economic assets, environmental assets, that's the planet, and social assets. And sometimes they call them cultural assets. Mm -hmm. So there's the people, planet, profit, three Ps, or uh, the kinds of assets that are all worth value to us. Okay? Cool. Yes? Uh, so far in your presentation, 